Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for staying back with us until the very last day of our BUU 2021. Uh, I was given the privilege to deliver the closing talk on a sponsor title by Astella uh, on the overactive bladder. The title of my talk is the Hold on to more and how can we optimize medical treatment for patients with male lux and OAB with a beta 3 agonist. Here's uh, my disclosure. So I divided my talk into three uh, main components. One, I will start off with the introduction to male lux and OAB as they are a little bit on their pathophysiology and, uh, ep and uh, uh, epidemiology. Following that, we will see how we can use currently available medical treatment uh, to uh, optimize and maximize the treatment benefit for our patient by refocusing on what our patient actually wants. And finally, I uh, will be a focused discussion on the use of beta-3 agonists in uh, treating patients with male lungs and OAB. So OAB is a very common condition, as we all know, and you have listened to the previous lecture by Dr. Lei. And the incidence tends to increase with age and also with patient comorbidity. And uh, there are multiple epidemiological data has been presented over the last 20 years. And uh, the most recent one is by the Hong Kong uh, Urology Group when they do a telephone survey. They found that the prevalence of OAB among women and men aged 40 and above is around 20%. And there's a significant higher prevalence among each age group if the pay, comparing those with certain comorbidity as to those without comorbidity, particularly those with diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, and neurological diseases tends to have higher incidence. And it's not surprising, in fact, nearly half of the patient has not received any treatment or consultation from their medical provider. And this is also shown on this slide, even among those with moderate and severe symptoms, up to 30 to 40% has never sought any medical help. And many will try a coping mechanism or trying to, and some may think this is not actually a medical condition that warrants a medical consultation. Then we come to a, a key question of today's lecture. Why does patient with lux come to see a doctor? I think there are three aspects in their mind which uh, have uh, important to make them come to see a doctor. One is that there is significant distress from the uh, this inconvenience or social inconvenience caused by the LUTs and the OAB and they feel of a significant disease, in particular cancer, or could be stones or could be renal failure. And this uh, fear and also this inconvenience has a negative impact on their quality of life. They are generating anxiety. That's why they come to seek help. So as healthcare provider, we need to address their underlying fear and also see how we can explain to them what are all the findings about in the, the, in the particular condition. As you all know, uh, OAD has been well defined in the previous lecture and what I want to highlight is that urgency is underpinning all the subsequent symptoms complex experienced by patients with OAB. With urgency, patient is experienced increased frequency and reduced interval of avoid. And if they cannot get to the toilet quick enough, that will lead to incontinence. And if that happens at night, that will make them waking up at night to pass urine more frequently. So that led to nocturia and decreased quality of sleep. So very important is that in all OAB study, urgency will be uh, primarily the, the uh, outcome measurements as a primary outcome measurement for most of the study. In the normal voiding cycle, as we know, there's a first sensation of void followed by subsequent uh, more sensation of void which have an increased uh, discomfort, this called urge that we may feel we want to go to pass urine, but nevertheless, it's quite easily suppressible without any inconvenience or discomfort to the patient. But in a patient with OAB, the urgency is different. When they experience urgency episode, there is a 
unsuppressible urge that you must empty the bladder. Otherwise, the patient will be very, very uncomfortable or may at times can lead to uh, a leakage of urine or a full voiding episode, as you can see here. During the urgency episode, the time the patient experiences urgency until the time he go to empty the bladder is called the warning time. Um, this is very important because if the warning time is very short, then the patient will have incontinence. So this is also one of the important factors in measuring the outcome of OAB treatment. So as we all know, male lungs can broadly categorize into storage, voiding, and post-void symptoms. And in storage symptoms, there are frequency, urgency, urge urinary incontinence, and nocturia. So this is called storage symptoms and also OAB symptoms. So in the voiding, then this is happened only during the patient uh, uh, emptying the bladder, start of a hesitancy, and then subsequently the flow pattern, and also when the patient complete the voiding, then they may or may not have void sense of incomplete voiding. And many times, these symptoms tend to overlap. And in fact, only about nine to 10% of patients who have pure uh, storage or voiding or post-void symptoms. Many of them, one quarter to more than a half, will have a kind of a, a combination of storage and voiding symptoms, up to 50% from the EPLAT study. So many times, the voiding symptoms tend to attract more attention in uh, addressing the problem of male lust, whereas the storage symptoms tends to be taught as a secondary symptoms by uh, in tweet by uh, many of the dogma or teaching that if you treat the voiding symptoms, relieve the obstruction, the storage symptoms tend to disappear. But is that so? If you look at the TURP uh, study in Japan, where you have an outlet obstruction relief, and you can see the improvement of storage symptoms tends to lag far behind avoiding symptoms. In fact, nocturia, only half of the patient will have a uh, relief of their nocturia symptom, whereas the storage symptom up to a quarter of the patient may not have any relief. So in the treatment armamentarium of OAB and male lux, there are many possibilities we can do. And you can look at the lifestyle modification, pelvic floor exercise, pharmaceutical intervention, injection, build botox, or even prostate surgery. And this obviously is an increased invasiveness. And many times, patients would like to just stop at medication. And today, our focus is going to be on the pharmacotherapy for the patient. Now, before I go to that, I would like to uh, recap on what is the means by uh, treatment philosophy of patients with uh, male LUTs and OAB. So the conventional wisdom of treating LUTs is very prostate-centric and uh, storage symptoms due to bladder outlet obstructions, uh, uh, storage symptoms which many times we think is due to bladder outlet obstruction. So by treating the primary cause like the bladder outlet obstruction, we think that the storage symptom will go away. But what is more likely to be true is that we are facing an aging lower urinary tract. The prostate, bladder, urethra, pelvic floor are all undergo aging changes, not just the prostate. So the bladder itself can have primary uh, uh, changes which led to overactive uh, storage symptoms. And we're also facing an aging neurovascular endocrine system. For example, patient may have diabetes, may have uh, Parkinsonism, and also the innovation to the bladder can have an uh, alteration as has been evidenced in historical examination. All this can lead to LUTs. And this is very clearly demonstrated in women who doesn't have a prostate, yet they can experience LUX and OAB when they grow older. So storage symptoms can also arise from bladder dysfunction without any outer obstruction, as we all understand it, due to the choose of overactivity. So male patients, I think, we need to understand, although they can have very easily identifiable or defined BPEO, but OAB can happen concurrently. With that, then we will have to look at the emptying and storage symptom in a different perspective. And many times, most of the time, in the 24-hour cycle, we spend 99% or more than 99% of the time in the storage phase, the bladder, whereas we only spend less than 1% of the time in emptying our bladder. You think about carefully. So which one is more bothering to the patient? Obviously, it's going to be the storage phase, not, during, not the emptying phase. So 
When the patient comes to see us, what does the patient actually want? As we mentioned early on, they want to rule out significant pathology. They want to have a rapid relief of symptoms with effective medical therapy. And they want this treatment to be durable and be safe. And most of all, if possible, they want it to cure the condition, meaning that give them a two weeks or one month of treatment, then uh, their condition will go away and will never come back. But obviously, some of these expectations can be met, but many need to be explained away or so-called manage the patient expectation. Yeah, so they do not get too dissatisfied with what is the actual eventual outcome. And in management of any luck or OAB, the first and most important is the lifestyle advice and self-care information for the patient as depicted in the EAU guideline. You need to educate the patient about why they develop the symptoms, easiest way to use a diagram of the lower urinary tract, and then you have to uh, reassure the non-cancerous nature of the symptoms by doing a simple investigation like urine FEME, ultrasound KUB at least, to rule out significant pathology, and a PSA will be a uh, uh, Will be indicated if the patient have a uh, will benefit from early detection of prostate cancer, and you should uh, periodically review the symptom every six to twelve months if you choose to manage the patient conservatively. In terms of lifestyle modification, then the list is uh, usually you look at their type of food, the amount of food, and the drinking time. And for post meal voidings, I think uh, there are many techniques you can use like milking or urethra, non medical therapy, basically. So I wouldn't go into that. Suffice to say, uh, this advice needs to be routinely given to the patient. For medical treatment uh, of the male lux, I think some of you may have seen this slide before, but I think it's very important for us to go back to basics. Then there's a sequence that we need to uh, very uh, important in assessing how to treat the patient. First, we look at the patient, their symptoms, their bothersome, significant comorbidity. Are they, are they, are there any uh, extra recycle cause for their lux? and then their age, sexual function, as well as uh, if there is any indication for prostate surgery. Well, on the prostate itself, um, although we, I try to emphasize in this lecture the overactive nature of the storage symptom, but we mustn't forget if there is a significant benign prosthetic uh, enlargement or outlet obstruction, we need to address the risk of progression of this particular condition by look at all those parameters. After looking at that, then we can choose from a wide range of medication in various combinations as to how to treat this patient, taken into consideration of the side effects and the expectation of the patient. In terms of the list of medication for male lugs, it's very long, but I categorize them into alpha broker, 5-ARI, anti-muscularinic, beta-3 agonist, PDE-5 inhibitor, and even some herbs. I put the letter smaller because I don't think it's very important for the discussion, but patient will use it, and usually I do not uh, make an active effort to discourage them from buying it. If they want to take it, they can take it. I don't see much harm besides financial toxicity to them to some degree. So we are going to focus on this group of drugs. So you see there are many drugs by itself and you can use them in the monotherapy on various combinations. And anti muscarinic and beta-3 agonists are the main things that we are going to use to treat the storage symptoms. And Typically, in patients with the male lust, especially age 40 and above with the enlarged prostate, they are used in combining, in combination with alpha blocker, uh, or sometimes even with 5-ARI. So, and beta-3 agonists can be used in a similar manner as anti -muscarine. So, you want to have a happy bladder, then you need to try to combine the non-medical as well as the medical therapy for the patient. Now, for storage symptoms, conventionally, on, uh, uh, we are using anticholinergic. There are so many types of anticholinergic in the market, we wouldn't want to go to it, but they have a similar class effect and class toxicity. So the toxicity is that they cause sedation, dizziness, confusion, and hallucination, central nervous system. They affect many systems because the, uh, the cholinergic receptor is present ubiquitously. So you can cause a uh, tachycardia, blur vision, hot dry mouth, dry throat, and all kinds of side effects. And the side effect is uh, universally observed across all anticholinergic. The yeah, difference is mainly in the release format of the tablets that can lead to uh, how rapid the patient develops symptoms and how common these symptoms are observed. So 
uh, I wouldn't want to go into that, but uh, there are many meta-analysis or systematic review of various kind of uh, anticholinergic published results in the randomized control trial and then group them together and compare. If you can look at it, uh, solifenacin, I think, is quite respectable in this field, and also uh, darifenacin and fisotirodine. But oxybutynin in its old format tends to have a very high incidence of dry mouth and it's short acting. So those are falling out of favor, except in some pediatric patients. But doesn't matter which one you choose, you will experience some of the side effects. In terms of EAU guideline on the use of uh, uh, anticholinergic in managing male lux is that you can use these drugs in the treatment of male lux or moderate to severity to severe uh, uh, lux with the dominantly story symptoms. Uh, you can use anticholinergic and provided the patient doesn't have a significant post sweat residual urine. When you choose anticholinergic, I think polypharmacies uh, has to be come to place. When the patient is elderly, they tend to use multiple drugs. Then you have to look at drug-drug interaction. And you also need to uh, look into the well-recognized facts of anticholinergic have a negative effect on cognitions. So what are the anticholinergic uh, patients may take besides the uh, uh, anti-mascarinic they use for their bladder? So they, can be, they may be on some antidepressant, they may be on uh, antispasmodic, or can be on some Parkinson treatment and even syrup Benadryl or anti-decongestion for their nose can have anticholinergic effect. And if your patient taking more than two drugs that have an anticholinergic effect, then their anticholinergic burden score will be two. So when two, according to the uh, NHS guidelines, that you need to be very careful with this patient. You shouldn't let them go up to three. So because the patient can have excessive uh, anticholinergic effect and then they may develop uh, more likely to develop so side effects. And uh, in the long run, the issue with anticholinergic is that it, has, it tends to, in some study, link to dementia in case control study. But uh, um, more important is to remember some absolute contraindication that retention of urine, toxic megacolons, and also narrow angle calcoma, which is uh, uh, must routinely be asked to the patient whether they've got any eye problems. Huh? And not uncommon, your patient may have a grade 3 or 4 renal failure and also some hepatic dysfunction. Using of this drug need to be cautioned in this particular group of patients. And you shouldn't exceed a 5 mg dose for the lowest effective dose for the patient to start off with. So, for the elderly, I think EAU have a statement, some uh, summary of evidence on the review of all the publications is that in elderly who cognition is uh, impaired, the use of certain anticholinergic is still safe, in particular solifenacin, darifenacin, and pistotirodine and trospium. They tend to show uh, very insignificant negative impact on cognitive function, but only in short-term use. There is no safe safety data on long-term use of anti-muscarinic agent in elderly patients. So need to be very careful in this particular group of patients. So then we come to the use of Mirabegron. I think Mirabegron uh, is not really a very new drug that has been in the market in Malaysia more than five years already. And it goes through uh, a different uh, pathway in uh, relieving the detrusor muscle, uh, relaxation of the detrusor muscle which led to a relieving of the overactive bladder symptoms by uh, stimulating the beta-3 adrenergic receptor in the detrusor, particularly the dome, which itself led to relaxation. So as compared to uh, anticholinergic, which is on the parasympathetic pathway. So with the sympathetic pathway, there will be some concern about hypertension and tachycardia in this particular group of patients, and as well as arrhythmia possibility. But the risk in the Public publisher uh, RCT is very low and no higher than placebo has been observed. So how about the safety of using these drugs in the elderly? In the PILA study, I think they found that the efficacy among the group of patients who are less than 75 compared to more than 75, they are equally efficacious. And as well as in terms of their side effect, there's no excessive uh, negative side effect observed in the elderly group as compared to those less than 75. Uh, I would, do, would not want to go into many of the RCT com, uh, in the registry trial for the Mirabegron, but uh, there is a systematic review on uh, comparing Mirabegron uh, and uh, anticholinergic in terms of managing of overactive bladder, their efficacious and as well as their side effect profile. I think they are found to be uh, equally effective in relieving the urge urinary incontinence when you compare beta-3 agonist 
uh, uh, with uh, all the uh, anti muscarinic there's no significant difference and all of them are effective against placebo and in terms of frequency as well and uh, seems to be uh, in the middle of the forest pros uh, so there's no significant benefit in terms of their efficacious and but there is a significant benefit in terms of dry mouth made up background compared to any of those anticholinergic a significant lower incidence of dry mouth is almost uh, as uh, similar to placebo as you can see so EAU's uh, recommendation for uh, beta 3 agonist is that so the, it can be used in patients with moderate to severe lungs in particular with the storage symptoms but uh, the evidence strength seems to be uh, at this moment categorized as weak because uh, level 1 evidence uh, uh, is still uh, uh, not uh, present so <clears throat> the use of a uh, mera background in a combination of alpha blocker so in as we all know we are always worried about giving anti muscarinic or beta 3 agonist in patients who have some bladder outlet obstruction and are thinking of getting into retention so suddenly this fear is uh, to some degree justifiable but uh, it, it tends to be overemphasized in fact it's not contraindicated as i show you on the eau guideline uh, there are two studies to show plus study and match study on the different group of patients uh, in a phase 4 study rct placebo control randomized trial to show that adding a mera background on uh, to a tamsulucin in patients who have male lungs with oab symptoms uh, uh, is effective in terms of uh, reducing the uh, urinary incontinent episode and uh, all the parameters so you look at this uh, plus study in this uh, Phase 4 multi center RCT in North America and Europe. Uh, men aged for more than 40 receiving either Tamsulucin, run Imperial, one month, followed by uh, randomization. So they are divided into two arms Tamsulucin 0.4 plus placebo or Tamsulucin plus Mera background. So the total duration of treatment is up to 12 weeks and the end of study is at three months. So I look at the primary endpoint, basically the measurement of the number of voids as well as the urgency episode for the patient. The baselines are very comparable. Most of these patients have moderate to severe uh, storage symptoms and the number of uh, voids is more than 8. 8 to 15 is 91% uh, of them. More than 15 considered very severe or a small number of them. And the number of incontinence episodes, you can look at it. One third of patients have wet OAB. So, and uh, also about 10% have previous treatment with OAB but they have been stopped before they enroll into this particular study and the first look at the primary endpoint and uh, you reduce the pre adding mila background certainly reduce the number of maturation by two over a 24 hours period of time compared to tamsulucin alone which reduce 1.62 so the absolute benefit is around 0 0.4 0 0.5 so at end of study, the number of uh, urgency episodes that mean the patient sends the, the urge is uh, reduced by 2.9 episodes in the Tamsulucin plus Mira background arm compared to the Tamsulucin plus placebo arm is minus 0 0.24, 2.24. So these are also statistically significant. So in terms of safety and uh, tolerability, there is no unusual side effect observed in this particular group and both are relatively comparable no significant difference and there are six patients develop a uh, retention in the mirror background arm as compared to the placebo arm but uh, i think uh, only about two of the patients require categorization retention maybe is uh, defined as the post work residual of more than 150 so there's no serious adverse event in terms of cardiovascular toxicity observed in this particular study another similar very similar study called match study is done in Korea and Japan, mainly in Japan, and uh, quite similar study design, but they use the standard dose of tamsulucin of 0.2 milligram. So this is relatively a very low dose. So we never use 0.2 in Malaysia, very seldom we use 0.2. So it looks like the plus study is more appropriate for uh, Malaysians. Uh, uh, population and uh, data are more translatable to us and quite similar study where you can see uh, randomization after one month run in of uh, tamsulucin followed by placebo or meravagron 50 milligram as a standard dose so meravagron again the measurement is the same reduce the number of voids huh? 1.27 as compared to 0 0.75 
So uh, over a 24 hours period of time and the urgency is, uh, in this particular study, the urgency, the nocturia is not significantly different in these two arm compared to Tamsulucin with placebo or Tamsulucin with uh, very background. But in terms of the uh, OABQ symptom bothersome score and uh, also the uh, health related quality of life score, that certainly those who are taking their background are far better as compared to those who are taking placebo. So across the board is that when uh, the in summary is that the storage symptom score is improved, the IPDSS score is also improved and whilst the avoidings, uh, QOLs, there are some marginal improvement. Yeah, as you can see there, the avoiding uh, subscale is not negatively impacted by the adding of a better background. So the patient do not perceive any slow flow or improved in flow with the additional of better background, despite the increase of the bladder or the volume. So in conclusion for this study is that, I think uh, OVB I think is very prevalent, that's what we know. Symptom border is significantly higher among males reporting OAB symptoms either alone or in combination with other LUTs in those who are reporting non oab LUTs. So you if you combine marrow background with tamsulucin in male with LUTs and OAB symptom, and you can establish story symptom with the dominant symptom, marrow background will have added benefit in reducing their frequency of void and the urgency episode, which is uncomfortable to the patient. And with that, they can indirectly improve their quality of life. So the cardiovascular toxicity is no extra is observed in the match post hoc analysis. It's, it's published already, so it's uh, safe to use it in this group of patients, in other words. So my, fi in, my final conclusion is that, ladies and gentlemen, is that male lust is frequently uh, associated with OAB, and we shouldn't overlook treating OAB in its own right. So male LUTs with dominant storage symptom can be effectively treated with uh, alpha blocker and beta-3 agonists in a combination. And uh, we should exert caution in using these drugs in the long term for patients who are elderly, probably defined as those 65 or 70 and above. And in particular, anticholinergic is, uh, should, be, should not be used for long term. Long term, I would say it's more than anything, more than three months or six months, we should be cautious. And I think beta-3 have a better safety profile in terms of uh, side effects. And uh, so it can be used for this particular group of patients. Thank you.